Hi, everyone. Can you see me? You are on. OK, great. So hi, everyone. My name is Shugan Agarwal. I'm a plastic surgeon on Sydney's North Shore. And we are doing a Facebook Live. Um, my, we, and my topic is how to really care for your implants, but in general, breast surgery uh, and breast uh, implants in general. And we might wait a little bit to just see um, if we get a few more people. Uh, maybe wait a little bit more. I'll, get, I'll tell you a little bit about myself in that time. So um, I'm a plastic surgeon in Sydney. I do both uh, public and private work. I work at two large teaching hospitals in Sydney, which is Royal Prince Alfred and Prince of Wales Hospital. Um, and I do a whole bunch of uh, breast reconstructive work as well as uh, other reconstructive surgeries. And in my private practice, I do uh, a whole bunch of um, breast and body work. Um, so that includes, again, breast reconstruction, but a whole lot of breast reductions, breast lifts, uh, implants, implant revisions, uh, and body work like body lifts and tummy tucks um, and things like that. So um, we, we thought it would be a good one for my first lesson of life to talk about um, breast and body. So we've had um, a few questions submitted to us already and they're actually really good questions. So I thought I would um, start with some and of course if you guys have some questions um, as we go on then feel free to jump in and ask some questions. Um, so the first question we had was how do, how often should one get their implants checked and really who should check them? Should it be a plastic surgeon or can it be really anybody? So look, I'm not sure what a lot of my colleagues and other people do around town, but what is really good uh, practice is if you've had someone do your breast augmentation and they've put implants in, well really they should be the ones um, who uh, check your implants and what we do here at um, our practice is to offer uh, a yearly checkup and what that is is for us to clinically examine you and have a look at the shape make sure that the breast shape is still very good the implants feel like they're intact their position hasn't moved there's no fluid and there's no other concerns and for the first 10 years that's really all we do once yearly check make sure they're all good um, and we'll let you be on your way and come back in another year now when you get to the 10 year mark we may suggest, well, actually, we do suggest that you have a yearly ultrasound and you think, well, why do we need that? That's because all modern quality implants are of really good quality. Um, so I've got, you know, uh, you know, very good quality implants. And if you were to actually slice these in half, the um, they're not going to actually, the silicon's not going to leak out all over the table or in my hand. It's literally just going to stay there. So in other words, if you had a small rupture of your implant, you're probably not even going to know uh, that that's the case. Um, but uh, you'll pick that up on an ultrasound. And so basically after 10 years, we would do a yearly ultrasound and make sure that was okay. And if that, that was good, we would leave you alone. And if at any point uh, there was a suspicion of rupture or something had changed, we'd offer you an exchange and another surgery. So um, I hope that that one sort of answers that. But yeah, it should generally be your plastic surgeon or whoever put those implants in um, as they're sort of the most reliable person to be able to pick up those problems. And someone not experienced in doing that is going to find it very hard because the quality of implants is so good. Um, so the second question that we've uh, had is, I, well, firstly, it was do does having implants actually make it harder to pick up breast cancer? Uh, and secondly, do um, can the implants rupture during a breast screen? And really, who can do that breast check if you've got implants? Um, and can the regular breast screening people do it? So the first part of that question was breast cancer and breast implants. Now, it doesn't really make it, well, in some ways it can make it a bit harder for them to do a mammogram just by the fact that you've actually got an implant sitting behind your breast and especially if that implant is sitting right underneath the breast tissue that can be a little bit more tricky if it's under the muscle that makes it a little bit easier because it's actually still possible to manipulate the breast gland um, and do the mammogram so in general most radiologists and radiology practices will be quite familiar with um, knowing how to image uh, the breast with the breast implant in place um, so I would imagine that most people would be able to do that. 
it's probably always good to ring them up and tell them that's the case. Um, and maybe sometimes breast screen, if they struggle with that, well, you could just uh, go to any radiology practice and they should be able to, uh, to do that for you. Um, I think the rupture rate is very minimal and we certainly would recommend that anyone in that category um, of possible breast cancer risk should actually have their regular screening and should not interrupt that. So uh, hopefully that answers that question. So um, my next question was, I am worried about, um, sorry, that I want to know how long do you wear a surgical bra after breast augmentation and which one really is the best? And is it the same as a compression garment? How do I know which one I'm going to buy? Um, so after breast augmentation, you say, well, why do we even need a sports bra or really anything compression garment? What, what's the point? Well, we've placed an implant underneath your breast uh, or underneath the muscle. That implant is naturally by gravity going to try and come down uh, and with the action of the muscle go out. And so what we want um, to do is to support that while the early capsule or your body scar tissue is forming around the implant. So by having a compression bra or a surgical bra, you are avoiding that implant basically with the weight of gravity pulling or pushing down on the stitches that have just been placed uh, and also moving uh, laterally or towards the armpit. Um, and so by having a, a good bra, like a surgical bra, is sort of helping that early healing while the capsule is forming. And so we generally say you should have a, a, a sports bra or a surgical bra for about six to eight weeks. And that's the same amount of time that you should avoid having or avoid doing upper body uh, exercises, again, because of the risk of moving your implant. So um, it doesn't matter which one you buy. No, it really doesn't. You can um, buy uh, any, anything that really achieves that aim. So basically something without an underwire, it achieves good compression, it fits you fairly snugly. Um, and whether it's an over the, you know, whether you go to Kmart or Target or buy something really relatively simple, uh, usually your surgeon will give you a sports bra to wear that's quite fitted to you. Um, but you may want to have a few spares. So no, it doesn't matter which one you buy as long as it's supportive. And we say wear that 24 seven for the first six to eight weeks. So um, yeah, I hope that that uh, makes that even clearer. Um, so the next question is interesting where it says, your topic for caring of implants makes me wonder what particular things should I really be doing for caring for my implants? Um, so I guess by that we really mean what should you do in terms of you know yearly checkups and things like that so um it's not one where you need to do something particularly every year but there was a time where um surgeons when they used to put smooth implants in they used to create a quite a big pocket and they then used to say you need to massage the breast and move and displace the implant and we don't do that anymore so there's no specific exercises no specific things that you need to do but you should have a yearly checkup of your implants and that's just to make sure that they are in the correct position. There's certainly no obvious misshape, uh, so change in shape. Um, the breast tissue over it is sitting where it needs to be. There's no fluid. Um, and if you've done that every year, you get to about 10 years, then you probably should have a yearly ultrasound. On top of that, do your you know regular mammograms or other screening that you're meant to do. Um, and if all of that's um, good, then that's pretty much all you need to do in terms of caring for your implants. So, um, but, you know, I, I do feel that like a lot of women who do come to me for implant revisions um, or, you know, they've got old implants in and they've never really had any checks whatsoever since they've had them put in. So, you know, please insist on doing that. Um, so just seeing if we've got any more new questions or um, anything that everyone's uh, got on their mind. But I'll move on to my next question, which... Um, is I am thinking of having a um, tummy tuck and breast reduction or lift or both. Um, but I work in a supermarket and I'm wondering whether it would be better for me to have this as one procedure um, or having it done one at a time because I can only get two weeks off. And um, that's a really good question. So um, what I would say is that the procedure of having a tummy tuck is really the bigger one of those two. So if we talked about the breast reduction or lift, so that's a, um, and there's another question about that, so I'll go into that a little bit more detail in a second, but a breast reduction uh, procedure is usually about 
three hours long, it's under a general anaesthetic. Um, we, most surgeons now around town, we don't use drains for that sort of procedure. We do usually keep most people in overnight uh, in hospital and that's just for making sure you're comfortable, uh, there's no issues and usually it's rebated by Medicare and a health fund so they're paying those hospital fees anyway. Um, usually the next day we um, make sure everything's okay, let you go home and then we'll do our routine follow-up. And usually most of those wounds would actually be healed in the first two to three weeks. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of downtime from surgery or, um, uh, you know, I think two weeks is pretty good. The only thing I would say is the reason that we don't put drains in anymore is because we find that they didn't really add anything, you know, they don't really prevent fluid collections or bleeding or anything like that. But having said that, if you've just had surgery on your breast and you've got scars, you've actually, you know, we, what we've done in surgery is obviously operate on the whole breast. We've put it back together. It's now sitting on the chest wall of the underlying muscles. And if those muscles are moving and the breast tissue is moving over that, well, that can create a bit more fluid. So, um, well, that's something you don't want. Um, and so um, what you need to really do is um, not be doing any heavy lifting. So, um, you know, it's about, it's, it's probably for a period of about six to eight weeks. And if you start doing heavy lifting and things early on, you can really run into the problem of having um, a seroma or a fluid collection, which you don't want, because once you get that, you need to stick a needle through the, through the skin, um, until that's dry and you might do that a few times so it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small hassle but it's still a hassle but it's, um, so I would say breast reduction I think you can definitely do a little bit of downtime but if you could do some reduced activity at work without lifting then that would be totally fine if on the other hand you're doing a tummy tuck tummy tuck I find is something that needs to have a moderate amount of downtime so and that's because when we do a tummy tuck operation oh, I might actually use a diagram to explain this one so um, you know, we'll just make sure we can see that. So when we do a tummy tuck operation, we are taking our tissue all the way from the belly button down to the groin. And that's only part of the operation where we also underneath the six pack muscles are also being operated on. And most people, these muscles are separated um, from pregnancy or weight gain and weight loss. And so what we will do is actually stitch those muscles together. Now, if you think about how many things you do where the muscles um, are actively working, where core muscles are working, well, pretty much anything you do, you know, if you lift any weight, you bend down and reach something, you go to the bathroom, anything like that, well, all of them are trying to activate those muscles and we're trying to protect them. So those movements are going to be a bit sore and we also want to protect those muscles and the operation we've done. So we really want no lifting for about six to eight weeks. Um, in addition, we've taken out a whole bunch of skin. So you've now got a big scar. We actually lift up all of this skin and that window shades down. And so initially when you get out of uh, bed, you need to do that being hunched over. And so and you straighten up, you know, day by day. So I feel that for the tummy operation, there's a reasonable amount of downtime. There's about six to eight weeks where you really can't be doing any lifting. You've got a binder that you're wearing all the time. And then once the drains and everything are out, that six to eight weeks, the, the binder comes off. You can then and start doing some gentle lifting. And see how you go, but it can take about three months to really be, you know, really doing a lot of lifting and things like that. So if you're working in a supermarket, I would be cautious about getting back to work too quickly. Um, and you may need a lot more downtime. So in answer to your question, I think the breast reduction is fair. Tummy tuck, you need a bit more time. You certainly can do those two operations together. And really the limiting thing is, you need to have enough downtime for the tummy side of things. So, um, yeah, so I think, you know, consider your circumstances before jumping into that one. So we have a, uh, uh, a question from the group, which is, can you suggest a health fund that is compassionate to massive weight loss patients who have excessive skin causing pain and rashes? Um, so the answer to that question is um, that in fact, uh, someone who has had a massive weight loss and who's having um, problems with their skin with rashes or breakdown of skin, well, that's actually pretty fairly covered by a Medicare item number. And if that's covered by a Medicare item number, so there's, there's there are two numbers, which are 30177 and 30179. So 77 really covers like a tummy tuck type procedure and 79 covers the body lift. Um, 
what you really need to do is just make sure your level of health fund coverage covers that level. So if you, um, you know, you should basically be in any health fund, you could be in any health fund, uh, sorry to say, is basically you can just, if you're of an appropriate level in that health fund, you should basically be covered. So there shouldn't really be a scenario where a particular health fund just says you're not covered for some for a particular procedure. Um, you may need some documentation by your, uh, not by your surgeon, but potentially by your GP to document the amount of weight that you've lost, that you to document that you in fact have these rashes and problems with your skin. And lastly, that you do, you have tried other ways to try and resolve that issue. And then you should meet the criteria. And that will be hugely beneficial because then the health fund and Medicare pick up the cost for um, all the health, hospital fees, all the theatre fees, and you'll get a rebate for surgeon and anaesthetic fees and there's no GST, which massively, you know, reduces the cost. It can be, you know, less than half of what it would cost otherwise. Um, so I think uh, talk to your fund. And uh, just on that point, um, from, you know, in the near future, the health funds are going to be in tiers. So there's going to be a um, bronze tier, a silver tier, and a gold tier. Um, and that gets a little bit confusing, but in some ways that's going to standardise sort of coverage and um, you need to really be in that gold category from your health fund to be covered for um, massive weight loss sort of surgeries uh, that would include everything from tummy tucks, body lifts and things like that. So um, hopefully that answers that question. I have um, another question from the group, which is that um, I am having my last child in four months time and I'd like a tummy tuck as I have to have a C-section, would it be possible to have a plastic surgeon do a tummy tuck as well? Um, so, look, that's an interesting question. I, um, I've come across that request, not in the form of a um, tummy tuck at the site time of the C-section, but more so a surgeon being, or a plastic surgeon being involved in making the wound sort of meticulous and as neat as possible. Um, look, I, I think I would say that I think having a tummy tuck at that point is probably a bad idea for a couple of reasons. Um, and I certainly wouldn't recommend that. And that's because, well, look, that, that operation is uh, a C-section. Obviously, the first and foremost responsibility in that operation is to make sure your baby's safe and that you're safe. And so when you have your baby, really the focus is make sure the baby's okay and then taken away by the nurses, make sure they're okay. And then obviously then you and, you know, trying to make that operation as simple as possible. Um, most of those are done with some sort of a block and so you're not fully under and that would actually be much harder to do with a tummy tuck operation as well and you potentially don't want a long general anaesthetic which can then affect the baby so you know it makes that complicated but I think the most important reason is you need to have had your baby and then see what you're left with because when your belly is all expanded it's very hard to judge how much loose skin you've actually got. And, and in fact, at that particular point in time, you may not actually have that much loose skin and it may be hard to actually sew your muscles back together. And so afterwards, um, once you've had your baby, uh, you've lost some of that weight, um, that's the best time because you've then got to a stable weight, um, hopefully you've got a really nice healthy baby, um, you can then work out, uh, okay, I've actually got a fair bit of loose skin or I don't. Um, and in the chance that you actually don't and you recover really well, hey, you may not even need the operation. But on the other hand, if you do have some loose skin and some muscle separation, well, then you can actually go and try and get as much of that skin out and make this uh, muscle as tight as possible. Um, so I would do that as a standalone procedure. The last thing I would say is if you were having, um, if there was any part of you that thought uh, you were going to have more kids, then obviously wait because you will undo the results of your tummy tuck. So, um, you know, but if you're sure that it's your last baby, just wait maybe even three to six months, I'd say at least six months, and then um, work out what skin is left and work out if that's a good operation for you. Um, so, uh, see if we've got any more questions from the group, otherwise I'll go to my list that we've submitted um, beforehand. So. My next question is actually a really interesting one, which is what is the difference between a breast surgeon and a plastic surgeon when it comes to breast reconstruction after cancer? Um, who would be the best to choose? Um, my girlfriend suggested that I see a breast surgeon because that's all they do, but I thought that a plastic surgeon would have been the right choice and now I am really confused. So um, 
as a as a as a plastic surgeon who does a lot of breast reconstruction, um, I get this question a lot. Um, so I would say to you, really, it depends on what um, reconstruction you are going to have uh, in a nutshell. But put it this way: that a breast surgeon is definitely the expert at sorting out the breast cancer side of things. You know, as a plastic surgeon, I don't manage breast cancer itself at all. You know, the breast cancer surgeon knows exactly, you know, when is mastectomy or lumpectomy appropriate, when to clear your lymph nodes. They've got linkage to medical radiation oncologists and all of that. So I can, they're definitely experts in that. On the other hand, you know, as plastic surgeons, we do reconstruction all the time and we have all of our uh, options at our disposal. And by that, I mean, on one hand, so there are basically three main categories and I'll use my thing. Uh, my little sheet again. So there are three main categories um, for uh, breast reconstruction, which are implants alone. Sorry, I'll move this in a way that you can see everything. There's your own tissue. And the third one is sort of a mix and match. And I'll explain each of these in a second. So if you were having um, implants alone or the first category, Who's a good candidate for that? Well, the people who have a really good breast shape to begin with, generally they're on a smaller side, the nipple's in a good position. Um, they may even be keeping their nipple as a result of the breast surgery and the breast surgeon is just removing the breast tissue behind. Well, they're a really good candidate for uh, a potential implant. Now, on the other hand, if you have someone who's got a very droopy breast, their breast, the nipple is not in a good position, or alternatively, they are going to have radiation as a likely possibility in the post-operative period. Well, that's the, actually the enemy of implants. And implants in breast reconstruction have about a 20% complication. Now, if you had radiation as part of your treatment plan or that was going to be anticipated, well, that can actually go up to 40 to 50%. And by that, I mean 40 to 50% of women who have implants in a radiated setting will probably be back in my office or someone else's office asking for a revision of their reconstruction. So I, as a rule, don't offer implant reconstruction for anyone with radiation in the past or who's planning to have radiation. And that's, I think, where the main limitation lies if you were going to have reconstruction with a breast surgeon who largely can definitely do your implants, but in that setting where you know the radiation or something else is involved or your breast shape isn't perfect, well then you need a plastic surgeon really. I would even argue that even in implants alone, given that we do so many implant, implant revisions and other things in cosmetic setting, we're used to really manipulating those implants and making sure that they're sitting in the right spot, how to get the breast shape and so on. So I'd argue that even there, there's some benefits to have sort of two surgeons one, you're picking their brain for really doing the breast cancer management and the other surgeon is just managing, you know, your reconstruction. I think in that way you've got best of both worlds. But really, if you need your own tissue reconstruction, so who's going to have that? Well, if you've got plenty of tissue in your belly, well, one of the biggest and best operations we can do for you is a DF flap or a DIEP flap. And that is a very complex microsurgical operation um, which really involves transplanting tissue from your belly up to your chest. And that is really, you know, the armamentarium only available to a plastic surgeon. If you weren't a candidate for that, so let's just say you didn't have enough tissue to give somewhere else in your body, who really is going to need a mix and match approach? Well, it's the person who I alluded to in the first setting. They've had radiation, they um, haven't got a good breast shape, whatever. And they need in that setting, they need, they don't, sorry, they don't have enough tissue to give. They really need to have uh, an implant, but because of radiation, they need some sort of tissue to cover that implant. And usually in that setting, we use a muscle from the back called the lat dorsi muscle. And that's another operation that um, I don't know really any breast surgeons who do that operation. Um, and so again, you will need uh, the expertise of a plastic surgeon. So my you know, obviously I'm biased, but I would say it's best to really pick the brains of two people who are experts in their own field. By, by seeing a plastic surgeon for your breast reconstruction, you are definitely um, opening all the options that are available to you, irrespective of what you've had, what your breast shape is, whether you've had radiation, really anything, you give us anything and we'll be able to 
offer you some sort of reconstruction um, and hopefully perform it well. So um, I hope that answers your question. So I would um, strongly suggest to, see an, to seek an opinion from a plastic surgeon for your reconstruction. Um, so uh, just checking if we have any other new questions. Um, and if we don't, I'm going to go on to my next one, which is, do you do fat transfer when doing a breast reconstruction? So um, the answer of this is a little bit uh, complex, but I think I'm going to go back to my little scribble of what different options are there for breast reconstruction. So if we um, go with, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about my sort of one of my favorite operations, which is number two. So if we went with your own tissue reconstruction, in which case we are using, you know, your belly or something else purely to make a breast or maybe even two breasts, well, that whole operation is dependent on blood supply. And what we're trying to do is transplant that tissue from your belly up to your chest and basically behind your ribs with little blood vessels do microsurgery to make that tissue alive again. Now, if done well, all of that tissue should be alive. It should be soft. It should feel like a normal breast. Long term, there are no implants, uh, which means nothing to rupture, rotate, ripple. Um, there's nothing that's going to break into the 15 years. It is a permanent reconstruction. And you could literally say, I never want to see a plastic surgeon or a surgeon in my life and you'll be done. So that's a really good operation. And I would say when that's done well and there are no issues, um, there's actually no role for breast uh, fat grafting in that, in that scenario. So you shouldn't really have any deficits. But yes, if there are any small problems, and personally I've never actually done this, but if there were some small contour problems or anything, then yes, we could take some fat from somewhere else and it would be used to really just touch up things and that might be like the upper pole um, or, or you know somewhere else where that was a small problem. Um, so for touch-ups, that's a really good thing to do. Um, if we had implants alone, well, this is actually a common one where we would do some fat grafting in breast reconstruction. So um, when the breast surgeon does a mastectomy, they will usually go well beyond the boundaries of the chest. Uh, of the breast rather. So they will go as high as possible, as out as possible. And why they're doing that? Well, you're really there for a breast cancer operation. And whether it's a prophylactic or for breast cancer treatment, they're really going to try and take as much breast tissue as they possibly can. And so what the problem that that creates is when you finally set the implant in position, the implant may not completely fill that defect. So yes, you can pick some tall implants and certainly wide implants, but often there is a hollowing you know, in the inside or that cleavage area on both sides. And if that was a concern, then yes, the fat grafting is absolutely the best way to solve that. Fat grafting is, in some ways, it sounds better than what it actually is. What we usually do is take some fat either from the belly or thighs. We prepare that so that we just have the fat in the syringe. We then inject that in some thin layers um, into the chest. And what that really is doing is trying to pick up a new blood supply. So you can't put large clumps of it. You have to, so you have to be careful to just put thin amounts. And we know about half of that fat doesn't survive the transfer. So it's really good touch up operation. And yes, I would use it routinely in um, implant based breast reconstruction. And the last one really, <laughs> my mix and match approach, which was usually a lap dorsi flap with, a, with an underlying implant. Then again, I would use it for touch ups um, I don't find it's as common there because you've already got a healthy muscle covering it. But yes, if I had any issues, I would definitely um, use it for that for that scenario. So I hope that that um, helps. Um, my next question is um, about: Can you explain the different styles or types of breast reduction uh, and what are they? I've heard that there is. Um, an anchor and a lollipop. What, what does that mean? And are there any others? One would you do one and not the other? And is it something that each doctor prefers? Um, that's a really good question, actually. Um, so I'm going to use a diagram, diagram to explain that one. So when um, I believe we can see this. So when you have a breast reduction, there's sort of there are two problems. Well, actually, there are three problems. So firstly, the nipple is potentially too low and sometimes it can even be on the lowest part of the breast and that's sitting well below the fold of the breast. We also have too much breast tissue um, that's obviously creating the heavy weight and often it's creating the, um, 
you know, neck pain, back pain, brass traps sticking in and so forth. And the third problem is that you actually have too much skin. So not only do you have extra, too much breast tissue, but it's also extra skin. So we've got to correct all of those things. So the way that, you know, my, my favorite way of doing a breast reduction, and this is absolutely, you know, one of my favorite operations. And the reason is patients are just so, so happy. You know, pretty much I don't know a single breast reduction patient who hasn't loved their operation and afterwards they're also the same thing and they say, I wish I had it done sooner. So, you know, that's, that's by the by. But what uh, I work out, you know, where the nipple is going to go and we draw this pattern and I'll explain what that means. So I work out where is the nipple actually going to go? What is the idea? And obviously we want to try and get it above the fold of the breast. So how is that actually going to get there? We actually make some internal cuts in the breast, which will keep that blood supply to that nipple intact and also the nerve supply. So what does that mean? That means that it'll keep the tissue that's supplying the nipple alive and it will hopefully keep the sensation or the feeling of that nipple intact. All of this other tissue that is now heavy and saggy, we don't actually need that and that's what we're removing in a breast reduction. So when we reshape all of that, you will end up with a nipple and a line so in other words, sorry, a scar, a scar down, and yes, you'll end up with a scar in the fold. And that is an anchor type scar. Now, an anchor type scar does not actually tell you what has been done on the inside of the breast. And it is just as important to know what the scar is as what are the internal cuts that have been made. And so what I prefer is this pedicle, which is called a supramedial pedicle. And when I was uh, doing my training, you know, most, most surgeons would use an inferior pedicle. And now personally, I don't like that operation, even though what you would see on the outside would almost look the same initially, is what you've done in that operation is made the same template, but you've actually kept the nipple on tissue that is the bottom heavy sagging tissue, and you've actually removed a lot of the other bits of the breast that you would actually want, like for example, the fullness in the breast higher up. And so classically, the problem with those breast reductions were they look great initially, but after a period of time, they look really bottomed out. And by that I mean, it looks like you've got an empty breast up the top and then a nipple here, and it looks really heavy and saggy at the bottom, which I don't personally like that. So, um, so in answer to that question, Really, yes, there are different types, and I'll explain the other vertical scar pattern, but the um, uh, you need to know what scar, and really the, the anchor type scar is very common, and the reason for that being used is, well, at least in my practice, I see a lot of women with very, very large breasts, and so if they've got a very, very large breast and they're also a little bit older, I know that not only is it a weight problem, you need to remove the weight and remove the skin, and by actually having a longer scar, I can remove a lot more skin and therefore a lot, and also a lot more weight, and they look great immediately. And so, yes, there is a long scar, but it's actually hidden under the breast, and I haven't had a single person where that's been a problem. But if I was going to do a smaller breast reduction, um, almost a little bit like uh, a lift more than removing a lot of weight, well, then I would essentially be doing a very similar operation to what I just said. So if the nipple was down here, we would then work out where does the nipple need to go? Sort of something like that. And I would still use the same pedicle, meaning that same block of tissue keeping the nipple alive, alive. And I wouldn't need to cut out too much skin in here and here. And that's because I'm not really doing a big reduction of skin. And so the way that that person would end up would be with a scar around the nipple and a scar straight down or a lollipop scar. Now, if I compare that to my other drawing, this way. so when I compare that to the other drawing, it's actually the exact same operation as I was doing in the other person, but I judge it based on who has a lot more skin and a lot more weight to remove. They're generally gonna get the anchor type scar where someone is just having a small reduction or a small lift, they would tend to get the lollipop scar and my internal cuts in the breast are actually exactly the same because I'm keeping that block of tissue 
um, behind the nipple the same. So, um, and so I think you just need to talk to your surgeon and really work out um, what are they actually doing in the operation, what's the long-term outcome going to be, and where the scar is going to be. But I would say scars are one thing. What you really want is a beautiful shape that maintains itself over a long period of time. And that's actually dependent on where the internal cuts are being made and where they're and how and how everything is being sewn up. So um, I hope that that sort of answers your question. But in terms of uh, when would you do one and not the other? So that's how I decide between the anchor scar and the lollipop scar. Um, it's uh, it it is some you know what the internal cuts are. It basically depends on what sort of surgeon uh, or which surgeon you see, and they do tend to favour one versus the other. I tend to favour this sort of pedicle because I feel you want to keep as much tissue in that cleavage area and you want to get rid, you know, rid of the bottom heavy part of the breast and it maintains its shape long term and it looks really good straight away and long term all these patients look really good so I don't find any issues with the bottoming out and other problems. So um, we'll just see if we've got any more questions and we might be getting towards the end of our Facebook Live but I've got... Um, Another question which says, um, is there a Medicare item number for implants after mastectomy for from cancer? And the answer to that is definitely yes. So any um, breast sorry, any breast cancer procedure that involves reconstruction uh, is covered. And that is whether or not you have your own tissue, whether you have a mix and match approach or you have implants. So the things I would say about that are a few things. So if you've already had a um, mastectomy, then chances are, you know, you may have just a scar on your chest on each side. Now, if that was the case, well, you might need more than just putting implants in straight away because you've got, you know, a flat scar sitting on your chest and you now somehow need to create a mound and, you know, enough skin to cover that. And you will usually need to have an expander first, uh, which is like a temporary implant filled with saline, and you slowly stretch the skin out and then you change it to an implant and all of that's covered. The Medicare and health funds will pick up all of the costs for expanders uh, as well as your permanent implants. Um, they'll cover all the hospital and theater fees and everything associated with that. Um, if you were going to have, um, say, a procedure just on one side, and I've had a lady recently who we did a combination of a flap uh, and an implant on one side, and that turned out to be really good. All of that's rebated. But... She was actually a really small and very petite lady. And so she actually asked the question and said, what if I have an implant on my other side? Now that is a side that does not have breast cancer. And in some ways you are only putting an implant in on that side purely for cosmetic reasons to match the other side. Now the government does cover that as well because there is a Medicare item number that allows um, a surgeon to put in an implant on the opposite side because what you are doing is trying to match a breast cancer reconstruction. So that's um that's also in that case they'll cover again all the costs of surgery uh as well as the implant um cost and prosthesis cost so that is also covered so i just want to ask everybody if there is um any other questions um any concerns if that's thing as a silly question um but I, uh, you know this it's been Certainly a great experience being on here for the first time. Uh, I hope this has been uh, informative, but I think we might wrap that up very soon. Um, but uh, look, you know, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, so my practice is uh, mode plastic surgery where, you know, we've consulted in five locations around Sydney and my main practice is on the North Shore, but we also are in the inner west and um, uh, in the eastern suburbs. And, you know, jump on our website at modeplasticsurgery.com.au and uh, you'll see all that contact information. So hope this has been good and it's been really good to... Um, to Thanks so much.